glad to be here. Uh, I hope you're all ready to get a little weird. It's going to get pretty cool, pretty fun. Uh, we're going to illuminate a lot of interesting things about certain body parts in some of you. So get ready. Um, I am a biologist at the Exploratorium. So <laughs> thank you. Huge shout out to the Exploratorium. It's a pretty remarkable place. Um, but what that means for me is that, yes, I went to school for marine biology, but as a biologist there, I get to do all kinds of things. There's nothing terribly specific. Um, I can be working with marine organisms like that muddy, uh, not muddy bucket over there, or I can be educating people at an after dark about whale bones, um, all kinds of, of stuff. I mean, these are granted both marine centric. I, there's a bend to my, my passions, obviously, but Sometimes it leads me to slicing open bull testicles for work. Um, I got paid to do this, which is pretty cool. Um, yes, I get paid to slice open reproductive organs. Who gets to say that? Um, butchers, maybe? Uh, yeah, <laughs> angry women, maybe? Um, no, so I got to do some very casual research into the testicle, and this is kind of how I ended up with this talk. Um, I am by no means an expert in reproductive physiology or anatomy. Um, this is just something that I kind of stumbled upon for work and was utterly fascinated, so I'm gonna share that fascination with you. Um, there's a pretty remarkable world inside that tiny little testicle that a lot of you have. Um, <laughs> So get ready to have your minds blown wide open by your own testes. <laughs> <laughs> testicles! We know them, we love them, hopefully. Um, this is a testicle, this is a nice artistic rendering of one. And we're gonna hit up a few um, highlights, landmarks, interesting points of interest, interesting points of interest. Um, some really cool spots in the testicle. We're not gonna hit everything. This is not gonna be exhaustive by any means. There is a ton of information about the testicle. It's really pretty remarkable. I highly recommend looking into them. But we're gonna start where it all starts, in the seminiferous tubules. So when you slice open a testicle, like you do, um, they don't look like much of anything. They look kind of like a solid mass of nothing in particular. Um, they're just kind of, uh, the bull testicles that I opened, as you could probably see, it's about the size of a human kidney. It's gargantuan and terrifying. Um, but when you open it, there's no specific landmarks. Um, they just kind of look like an orange blob. Um, but only when you put them under a microscope do you realize that they're completely full of tubes. There are these teeny tiny tubules called seminiferous tubules, which is where sperm are created and they comprise about 90% of the testicle itself. The other 10% are a few other ducts, kind of like this reedy testis, the efferent ductules, things that take the sperm from where they start into the epididymis. Um, the seminiferous tubules, there are a ton of them. There can be anywhere between six to 800 of them per testicle, and each one of them can be up to 27 inches long. So one single tube inside a testicle can be over two feet long, and there can be 800 of them, which means that a single testicle, let's assume it's a nice, well-endowed testicle with very long seminiferous tubules and then the max amount that they can have. They're all 27 inches, they're all, there's all 800 of them, a nice even number everywhere. They can have over, they can have 1,800 feet of tubing in a single testicle that's only about that big. And there's two of them. And to put that into perspective, the Empire State Building is about 1,450 feet tall, which means the seminiferous tubules, just the seminiferous tubules in a single testicle, it put end to end are taller than the Empire State Building. And when you have two testicles, you've got 3,600 feet of tubing in those two testicles. And you have about two and a half Empire State Buildings worth of length inside your testicle. How crazy is that? Who knew? <laughs> So now that we've, you know, explored the seminiferous tubules, we've started off as a sperm, we're traveling, we only travel through one, unfortunately. I think about 1,800 feet feels like a little much for a single sperm to travel through. Um, but now that we've been created in the seminiferous tubule, we've traveled our way through 27 inches, we've ignored the reedy testis and the efferent ductules because they're short and we don't care about them today. We're talking about length. Um, we're now on to the epididymis. We're skipping a couple of things. We're going into the epididymis. And the epididymis is this weird kind of brain looking thing, this kind of comma shaped tube that's hugging the testicle gently from the side, kind of spanning from the top to the bottom. 
That is the epididymis. And because it only goes from about the top to the bottom of a testicle, we all hopefully know that they're not that large, which means the epididymis itself is only about an inch long. But it's incredibly highly convoluted and super compressed, and there's a ton of tiny little like squiggly bits, and, and it's really, <laughs> really highly compressed, which means that when you lengthen it for all the way, it can be 10 feet long. There is an incredible amount of length inside the epididymis. And it's so, so long. And the sperm are only about 50 micrometers, which I don't quote me on this, is I think 0 0.0002 inches. Tiny, obviously super, super tiny. Um, having that teeny tiny thing travel through 10 feet of distance takes forever. It can take between four and six weeks for them to just get out of the epididymis. We're still basically in the testicle and we've already gone over 10 feet. Whew. Exhausting. No wonder a lot of them don't make it. They're tired. <laughs> So once we're finally out of the epididymis, um, we're kind of down at the bottom of that nice almond-shaped testicle, we're gonna swoop up on this yellow thing called the vas deferens. That tube in Latin really just means carrying away duct, which means it takes things away from the testicle. Um, all it's really doing is just moving stuff out of there. And you might have heard about the vas deferens. That is the tube that gets cauterized uh, in a vasectomy. Um, so your testicle, if you have a vasectomy, congratulations. Um, the <laughs> testes are still producing sperm. They're just not going anywhere. They're hanging out in the testicle and they're being reabsorbed when they're not used. Um, so they're, you're still creating life in there technically, but it's not really gonna do much. It's not gonna get anywhere. But the vas deferens, there are two of them, obviously, for w one for each testicle. Um, and these are, when you think about it, you know, they're going from the base of this, you know, theoretical testicle here. Um, from the base of the testicle, they loop up above the bladder and kind of back around the bladder, and then they kind of turn into the ejaculatory duct. And so when you think about this, I'm short, too. So when you think about this amount of length and kind of looping, they are pretty long in their own right. They're about 18 inches, not quite as long as a seminiferous tubule, but still super, super long for something, you know, that's, that's a really tiny thing to be moving through that tube. Yes. It's not on here. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of near the prostate-ish. It's beneath the seminal vesicle. But we don't really care about the ejaculatory duct because it's only two centimeters long and it's not that impressive. Um, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So we're traveling through the vas deferens, we're, you know, looping around the bladder, we're saying, hi bladder, how you doing? Passing past the uh, seminal vesicle into the ejaculatory duct. Um, we're saying, you're, you know, you're fine ejaculatory duct, you're kind of short. And then it'll eventually, and hopefully, end up out the urethra, which can be an average of about eight inches. Um, so that means that a sperm traveling through a single, se or single seminiferous tubule all the way through the epididymis, all the way through the vas deferens to the ejaculatory duct, through the uh, urethra and out, hopefully into the wide open world to do what it wants. Um, it's traveling about 14 and a half feet just inside the body, which is kind of insane to think about. That's a lot of distance. And we'll, we'll see some distances later. We're gonna have some fun audience participation. Um, <laughs> But because there is so, so, so much length for these to go through and they're so tiny, it takes forever. They can take 65 to 75 days to create a sperm. And then they can hold in a, in a certain part of the vas deferens called the ampullae um, for a few days. If they're not used, they get reabsorbed and kind of like make the next one stronger, hopefully. Um, kind of like Dwight Schrute reabsorbing his twin. Um, <laughs> but it can take over two months to create a single sperm. So it makes you think a little bit better about, you just give them a little extra, like, good job, guys. You've seen their sightseers. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's well over two months to create a sperm. And just to briefly, briefly compare, we're not gonna be, we're gonna be mostly male-centric today because they do have like serious lengths within them. Um, but to briefly compare, the female reproductive tract is incredible in its own right. 
but we're not gonna go into that right today. Um, the lengths within the female reproductive tract are not amazing. Um, the egg being released from the ovary is gonna travel for, through the fallopian tube, and I'm only gonna focus on an unfertilized one because fertilized eggs turn into, hopefully, babies, and that's a whole other beast. Um, but an egg in a, in a woman is really only gonna travel about five inches because it, once it's in the uterus, if, it does, if it's not fertilized, it's just going to disintegrate and it's just going to come out in your regular period. So it's not exactly traveling at that point. It's not really a thing anymore. So they're not traveling very far. But they will do their, they'll, the, that tract will do its work later. Yeah. Yes. Um, so now, now that we've wound our way through the testicle, where are we? Yes. We're in the penis. Um, we're going to shift a little bit and talk about some of the world's largest penises because that's fun. Um, we all want to know about the world's largest penises. No, you can't say yourself and no, you cannot say Ron Jeremy. Who has any guess what the lar largest penis in the world is? Oh, I heard a lot of good things. I do love elephant seals. Um, it's the blue whale. Congratulations to whoever threw that out. Um, good job. Yes, the blue whale does have the world's largest penis. It is gargantuan. But that's kind of expected for the world's largest animal to have ever existed on this planet. These things can very easily be about 100 feet long. Meaning, not their penis. <laughs> Woo, no. God, no. That's a nightmare. <laughs> no, the animal itself can be about 100 feet long. Which means, sometimes, often, the average penis length for a blue whale is anywhere between 8 and 10 feet. So, Bart, if you'd like to help us out with our penis, um, just to get some consent, is everyone okay with having a fake string penis come out into the audience? Woo! Thank you. If anyone's uncomfortable with this thing coming in their general direction, just bat it away. Um, so this is going to be, so we're going to have maybe, so I would say stand up, show us the end of this penis. There we go. And then Bart or someone, any lucky person is going to hold the shaft end and extend it as far as they can, just so we can see how long that blue whale penis is. When you think about it, though, a 100-foot animal with a 10-foot penis means that its penis is only about one-tenth of its body length. And that's not, I mean, that's amazing, but it's not that amazing. Um, honestly, a human man can have that same body proportion. Um, so yeah, this is, this is a pretty impressive penis, right? Yeah. So a man can have this same body proportion as a, as a blue whale, as like the largest penis in the world. If a six foot man, anyone out here, has a 7.2 inch penis, he is, has a one tenth of his body length penis, just like the blue whale, which is a fun fact you can whip out at parties for your friends. They'll love it. <laughs> there you go, I am a banana slug. Yes. Um, they do other weird things. We're not going to touch on that. They chew them off. <laughs> Woo! Also, not only are they incredibly long, they are horrifyingly girthy. <laughs> Blue whale penises are 12 inches in diameter. Not circumference, diameter. When you think about it, that's like, that's like a lamppost or something. It's enormous. That's enormous. Stay away. But on to the next. Does anyone have a guess for second place? Second place, longest penis? Walrus. Oh, ooh, walrus is a good idea, huh? No, I didn't hear it. It's the African elephant. This is also not terribly unexpected. This is a very large mammal. Um, they come in at around, the average height of an African elephant is 13 feet, um, and their penises can be six and a half feet long, which is a little terrifying, because what that means is that this penis, beautiful, right? Their six and a half foot long penis is as tall as this. It's, in, it's so much longer than I am as a human being. Can you imagine this thing coming at you? And the horrifying thing about these is that they're prehensile, too. They can move around of their own accord. Um, they, there are 
amazing videos on YouTube. I highly recommend them. Of elephants <laughs> scratching their own stomachs with their penises. It's entertaining as hell. It's so much fun. I was giggling on the couch last night just watching it like a true scientist. Um, but yes, their penises are six and a half feet long. They, they're prehensile. They can generally swat flies away if they need to. There are photos of elephants using them as a genuine fifth leg to help prop them up a little bit if they're tired. Um, they are huge. But part of the reason for that is because A, they're giant animals, but B, the way that they reproduce is by mounting with this incredibly epic photo. Um, they mount each other much like a lot of animals but female elephants are not small. They're kind of like the Kim Kardashian of pachyderms. They've got a very big back end. Um, and so the amount of distance between her reproductive tract and his reproductive tract is fairly large. Um, hers kind of points downwards, and his is trying to find it, which is where the prehensile thing comes into play. Um, they want it to be able to like do some of the work, because that's a long member to like, flop around. So you want it to be able to find something. So, another part of the reasoning behind this incredibly long penis is the female herself, her reproductive tract is huge. Uh, this sort of blurry photo shows that their reproductive tracts can be over 11 and a half feet long. So that incredible blue whale penis isn't actually as long as a female elephant reproductive tract. The females have a very strange anatomy that I have never seen before and was very confused by. I want to do more of a deep dive on this, but... They have, not shown in this photo, they do have a classic external vulva and clitoris, actually. And then they have this long orange tube called a vestibule. Like a bank? I don't know. I'm not entirely sure what it's for, or like what it does. But if you can see from where you are, there's this long vestibule, and then the bladder, and then the vagina. Their vaginas start over four feet inside their body. Why? I don't know. Are they trying to keep dust out? I have no idea. I mean, it's dusty on the savannah, I would imagine. Like, maybe there's long grass, but still, like, that's a lot of distance. So that means that if she mates with a male who's not that well endowed, it may be like five and a half feet penis, like, ooh, five and a half. That's still taller than I am. Um, if she mates with a male that's got a five and a half foot penis and, you know, he's mounting, there's some distance it's got to, like, traverse before it gets in there, it is entirely possible that with a five and a half foot long penis, he's not even going to touch the vagina. How crazy is that? Sorry, man. Terrifying. Terrifying. But it's just flailing around. So, the next thing, the barnacle. This one, you wouldn't really think of, right? Barnacles, you don't think much of them. You see them at the beach, you see them on rocks, you see them on boats, big whoop, it's a barnacle. But what you don't know is that these bad boys are housing the world's largest penis in relation to their own body size. You would never expect it looking at these tiny little things, but they are well endowed. <laughs> <laughs> Not just yet. Um, actually, let's start unraveling this penis. So barnacles are amazing. Their bodies are basically at max about half an inch. That's about it. And their penis can be about eight times their own body length. Not one-tenth like the blue whale, not one-half like the elephant. They have eight times their own body length in penis. And penis, like they're more penis than not penis. <laughs> they're basically just a penis with a body attached to it. But I did the fun calculations and you can do this too. Um, I'm 5'3", and if I were to be a barnacle, my penis would be 42 feet long. So we're going to show you my penis, and we're going to have some fun. Uh, we can, you know, wiggle it around out here to show how long it is. It's going to traverse a lot of distance. So while that goes out, we're going to talk a little bit more about barnacles. Part of the reason... Pass it on down and then loop it around. Yes. <laughs> so it's Share it. <laughs> Part of the reasoning for this is that barnacles are hermaphrodites, actually, and they cannot self-fertilize. So they do have male and female reproductive organs, but they cannot, like, do the deed on their own. Um, they do need a mate. They do need to kind of get external help, um, external DNA, in order to reproduce. Um, <laughs> that does that lies in humans and chimpanzees and dolphins. Not chimpanzees, bonobos. 
different. Um, but yeah, so they can't self-fertilize, so they do need to find a neighbor because they themselves can't move. Damn, it's keep, that still keeps going. Let's bring it back this way. <laughs> keep it going. So they can't move. They're sessile. That means that white shell that they're in doesn't move for their entire life. The bodies within them can move. They've got these um, legs that they can use to feed, um, but they're not going to go anywhere. So what they need to do is find a neighbor within proximity of their incredibly lengthy penis. I could mate with someone back there without a problem. There we go. We can like loop around and hit that guy over there. <laughs> Congratulations. Does everyone see how long this thing is? Monstrous. Thank you. Thank you for entertaining my giant penis. Um, so what they need to do is unfurl their gargantuan penis to find a neighbor that's receptive. What they really do is just like start knocking on doors. Like, hey, anyone home? Are you free? Can I come in? Um, yes, that's what they do. They, you can see, that is a penis. These are technically legs, actually, that feathery part at the top. Those are just legs. But this long, extendable thing, that's a penis. And they can actually control how long it is and how girthy it is, depending on like the wave action at the moment. Because if they've got a really long, really flexible, really floppy penis, they don't want it out when the waves are bashing around because then it could get injured. So you're gonna keep it a little bit closer to home, a little bit wider. It's gonna you know, do the job a little bit closer to your house. Uh, <laughs> And this is one, so this one is not gonna be doing the proper job, he's mostly just showing off. There we go. So normally they should be reaching over and trying to find somebody and not just being like, hello. <laughs> but you didn't quite get the memo. But it's impressive, we'll, gi we'll give it to him. Her, it, because it's both. <laughs> uh, and so now that is the final giant penis that we're gonna talk about. We're gonna shift a little bit into Animals that go to incredible lengths, not just like anatomically in order to reproduce, but genuine like physical lengths in order to reproduce. Because there are some pretty remarkable animals out there that do really insane things. Like Pacific salmon, which you might have heard of. These are things that we've all probably eaten. Um, I have much more respect for them now after doing this research. Um, but Pacific salmon is kind of a, an umbrella term for salmon like sockeye, coho, chum, pink, all these kinds of things. And these ones hatch in eggs in freshwater rivers and streams, migrate out to the ocean, spend about a year to three years growing, getting fat, doing their fishy thing, trying to avoid you know, predators and, and people. Um, and then when their biological clock tells them, hey, it's time to, to reproduce, then they are driven to go back to where they hatch. They go back to their natal spawning grounds in order to reproduce themselves. Um, and that can be awesome if your spawning ground is, you know, 20 miles up river. Um, but a lot of them travel incredible distances to get back to those natal spawning grounds. Sometimes there's actually a population of salmon that spawns in Idaho, which is not exactly a coastal state. <laughs> so when you think about how far Idaho is from the coast, they're traveling there, practically on foot, on fin. Um, and they're going upstream the whole time, and they're not eating the whole time. They're doing incredible feats of physical exertion just to get back to where they spawned, or where they hatched in order to spawn themselves. And when they show up, I mean, can you imagine traveling 930 miles on foot to then try to have sex with something without any food in your system? You would look like this. And they do. They show up looking like utter zombies and they spawn. They participate in this like almost orgy type thing. And then they die because they're so exhausted and just like royally messed up from this incredible trek that they've undertaken. So that's a pretty extreme length to go to in order to reproduce. I'm not going to be trying that anytime soon. I don't think either any of you will be either. <laughs> and then the last thing we're going to talk about, certainly not the least, this is a marine flatworm. This is called a Persian rug flatworm. I think it's Indonesian. Um, and these are found in a lot of oceans all over the world. Um, and they're really, really interesting. They are hermaphroditic, just like the barnacles. Um, but these ones can move. You can't really tell from this because it just looks like a weird ornamental pancake. But they... 
they move around, but they want to be able, if they do happen to find one of their own, their own kind further on, they want to be able to reproduce with that no matter what it is. So if you imagine being a, a, like official, a, a, a male worm, and then you run into a male worm after a year of searching, and we're like, well, fuck, okay, like, big whoop, go. Now I got to find someone else. Maybe it'll take another year before you find a female. But the way you can get around that is if you're both both at the same time. You can get around that kind of, you know, well, I'm one and you're the other, or you're the same. So they get to be both sexes at the same time, but how do you choose who gets to be male or female? No one wants to be the female. Ladies, you're gonna know why. You kinda know why already. It's difficult. Um, female flatworms have a huge task ahead of them if they do, ha if they do reproduce. They can lay upwards of 3,000 eggs. It can take them well over 50 days to lay those eggs, and they have to find a safe space to lay those eggs, and they have to protect them with their own body. People have done studies on these flatworms and found that they will cover those eggs for up to 23 hours a day, which means they only get to try to find food for themselves for about an hour a day, which is a huge energy cost to be a female. So why would you be a female? You don't want to be a female, sorry. It sounds terrible uh, as a flatworm, yes. Um, so how do they decide who gets to be the male when you're both male and you're both female, but you both want to be one? You fight with your sharp barbed penises. That's what you do, <laughs> of course. Flatworms engage in a behavior called penis fencing, which hopefully doesn't exist outside of this group. Like, don't do this at home. It's dangerous. What they do is both, both worms will come together and they will evert their penises. Normally they're kind of inside. They will evert them and compete for upwards of an hour over who gets to stab the other one with their penis and inseminate it first before getting stabbed themselves. It's insane. Can you imagine reproducing this way? No. <laughs> no. So what they do is ultimately, I mean, they look like weird floppy pieces of pastrami, but they've got this sharp penis. You can see them. Sometimes they have two, which is also terrifying. And really, they'll just fight and keep jabbing at each other until one of them genuinely gets under the other's skin and inseminates first. And then the other one will have to absorb that sperm, and then it will fertilize their eggs, and then they have to go find a safe place to lay those eggs, protect them, and be and nurse a freaking like stab wound. Can you imagine? Ugh, oh, it's like getting stabbed, getting stabbed and pregnant all at once truly the worst but that's the flatworm for you and on that lovely note <laughs> thank you for listening to me talk about penises for about 20 minutes <laughs> go to nerdnight.com to find a nerd night event near you and don't forget to subscribe to our channel for our latest presentation